In the thrilling novel Rattle, a detective hunts for the sinister collector behind a macabre museum of medical oddities. Rattle by Fiona Cummins is on sale now everywhere books are sold. For more information, visit kensingtonbooks.com or follow at Fiona Ann Cummins on Twitter. Thanks to BetterHelp, you can connect with a professional therapist anytime, anywhere. To learn more or sign up, go to betterhelp.com slash cults. Enter the invite code cults to get your first seven days free and show your support for the show. There's no shame in getting help because you are worth it. Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. In part one of our investigation into Sylvia Moraz Moreno and her family, dubbed by Mexican media as the sect of Nakasari, we looked into the pre-colonial influences that contributed to the creation of the wildly popular folk saint, Santa Muerte, or Saint Death, whom the sect of Nakasari worshipped and ultimately killed for. We explored the Moraz family's biography and challenging socioeconomic situation, which culminated in Sylvia's leap from ardent Santa Muerte devotee to orchestrator of a human sacrifice to Saint Death, sometimes called the Bony Lady due to her skeletal appearance. In part two, we'll detail the remaining grisly crimes of the sect of Nakasari and investigate the community tip and investigation that eventually led to the family's arrests. And just a reminder, if you're as fascinated by cults as we are, you can listen to previous episodes of Cults on your favorite podcast directory. Don't forget to subscribe while you're there because new episodes come out every Tuesday. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review wherever you listen. It helps people like you find us. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and on Twitter at Parcast Network. It's hard to believe that in this day and age, people still make human sacrifices. But the sect of Nakasari aren't the only ones who've latched onto and engaged in this bizarre and frightening practice. Blunt force trauma, slit throats, positions of bodies, uh, and then our person of interest uh, has some ties to a a faith and or religion. He had to have told police that he intended to bring back his former girlfriend, win her affections back by uh, carving a pentacle on the little girl's chest. The, uh, Reverend Gerald Robinson, and he was charged with the murder of a nun going back to 1980. It was a grisly slaying in a hospital church it's, chapel. Uh, witchcraft, I'll, I'll say that right now. Time of death, we believe, on Tuesday also coincides uh, with what's referred to as a blue moon. I was out on the street crying and told passers-by what had happened. Police then went to Rodriguez's house. He wasn't there, but the little girl was with a 15-year-old, so they released her. Rodriguez came back with the incense and the candles he was going to use in the ritual, and they arrested him. The dispatch center received a call on the 10th from St. Mary's Church, from one of the uh, nuns who happened to be on scene, saying that we should come down and check out a woman who was acting erratically and was talking about sacrificing one of her children. An unhinged mother ranting about sacrificing her child, a ritualized murder beneath a blue moon, a nun's sacrificial slaying by a priest who was also accused of satanic sexual abuse. These are just a few twisted incidents of ritualized human sacrifice in the U.S. Unfortunately, there are also a number of prominent instances of human sacrifice from around the globe. In 2001, a case of human sacrifice was discovered in Britain when an unidentified child's body was found in the Thames River without a head, arms, or legs. Forensic experts who examined the body found traces of a poison known to be used in human sacrifice rituals. The poison causes paralysis, but doesn't dull pain. Meaning that the young John Doe felt everything, from the first cut until his death, as his captors dismembered him and drained his blood. Little John Doe has never been conclusively identified. His killers never caught. 
Albinos in countries such as Tanzania and Malawi are currently targeted for horrific human sacrifices. In certain communities, albinos are believed to be a punishment from the gods or cursed and should therefore be killed. In other groups, people with albinism are believed to have magical properties. They're hunted down and mutilated or killed for their blood and body parts, so the parts can be sold and used by witch doctors in spells and potions. The human rights organization Under the Same Sun released a report in January 2018 that documented 202 killings and 350 attacks of people with albinism, including mutilation, rape, abduction, and grave desecration across 29 countries. The report doesn't detail the reasons that each person with albinism was targeted, but the website for Under the Same Sun suggests that the most common causes of attack are discrimination, rejection from society, and superstition. Though globally, incidents of human sacrifice are widely condemned and fairly rare, the practice has by no means been eradicated. And the subjects of our story, Silvia Marez Moreno and her followers, who happen to be seven of her relatives, are a horrifying example of how human sacrifice still rears its ugly head when they were arrested in Sonora, Mexico in 2012. In the quiet Sonoran town of Nacazari de Garcia, Silvia led her family in the commission and cover-up of three heinous murders on three separate occasions over the course of two years and three months. All because Silvia believed the bony lady could protect her family and bring them peace, prosperity, and a better life. They took the lives of Silvia's close friend and two ten-year-old boys. How did Silvia get the idea that the saint she was devoted to, Santa Muerte, required human sacrifices? The Mexican media claimed the sect of Nakasari was satanic, implying the worship of Santa Muerte was akin to devil worship. But does the blame for the family's heinous acts rest at Santa Muerte's feet? Or was Sylvia responsible for what they did? Hmm. Well, in part one, we recognized the relative secrecy of the cult of Santa Muerte prior to St. Death's big coming out in 2001 when Doña Queta unveiled her life-size statue of Santa Muerte, which became a public fixture in Mexico City. After that, instead of hiding Santa Muerte charms under their shirts, many devotees started wearing them proudly. The undiscriminating folk saint became beloved by the dispossessed narcos and Mexican prisoners. While Santa Muerte had devotees across the socioeconomic spectrum, the wealthier among them tended to be quieter about their affinity for the oft-maligned Saint Death. And just a reminder, in the context of the phrase, cult of Santa Muerte, the word cult simply refers to the group of devotees to a saint and doesn't have any intrinsically nefarious connotations. Santa Muerte's reach spread beyond Latin communities into other groups, and she was particularly appealing to LGBTQIA people of all nationalities, according to expert Andrew Chestnut. An estimated 5 million people followed her in Mexico alone, with 10 to 12 million devotees across Mexico, Central America, and the United States. The subjects of our episode, Silvia Moraz Moreno and her family, found their way to Santa Muerte and to the extreme practice of human sacrifice not long after the turn of the century and became known as the Sect of Nakosari. Sylvia cooked up her potent beliefs through a powerful combination of isolation, desperation, and delusion. She harnessed the social power she wielded within her family system to coerce and indoctrinate her father, four children, live-in partner, and daughter-in-law into her plans. It bears noting that at the time of their first human sacrifice in 2009, Sylvia's son was about 25, and her daughters were 18, 17, and 12. There was also a two-year-old in the family, though none of the reports we found identified the child's parents. Sylvia's middle daughter was either late in her third trimester or had recently given birth. As you may recall from part one, the Moraz family lived in makeshift shacks on the outskirts of town without electricity or running water. The family was extremely destitute. While city government, the church, and some villagers offered the family aid, most people didn't want to be too close to the Moraz family. So really, the only thing the Morazes had to hold on to was each other. 
Though Sylvia's children, with the exception of the youngest, were technically old enough to think for themselves, that's not what happened. Vanessa's going to take the lead on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of research for the show. Thanks, Greg. It's difficult to grasp why Sylvia's children, especially her 25-year-old son, went along with her plans. But the fact that they did indicates the extreme level of dysfunction in the family. In part one, we touched on Murray Bowen's theory around undifferentiated family ego mass and how in that kind of family system, members are beholden to the unwritten rules of the family. They aren't free to act as individuals. That dynamic would have made it tough even for Sylvia's adult children to fall out of step with her. Mm, And even that's understating it. Clinical psychologist David Solani articulated the difficulties faced by abused and neglected children in a related but slightly different way than Bowen. Solani said in an interview with Columbia Press about his book, Leaving Home, quote, unmet childhood needs do not go away, but rather accumulate over time and stop the ongoing development of the child's or young adult's personality. As time passes, the individual's body grows up, but his personality remains fixated at an earlier stage of development. From what we know about the Moraz family, it really seems like Sylvia's kids' lives were dominated by need. The family's extreme poverty probably caused food insecurity, poor health care, and lack of safety. Yet the children always stuck by their mother and were never able to become independent of her. Unfortunately, their dependence on her reflects a dynamic that we've seen play out in other destructive cults. And as a parent, Sylvia was particularly well-equipped to make her children dependent on her. Solani said, quote, Parents who inadvertently stunt their child's development through indifference, excessive criticism, humiliation, mockery, or episodes of physical abuse stall their child's developmental progress. The child raised in this type of family ends up with an empty emotional fuel tank, remaining close to his parents because the outside world appears to be too daunting to enter, and because he lives in the endless hope of someday receiving the emotional support that will allow him to mature. So as crazy as Sylvia might seem to us, breaking rank in her family would have been really hard. Exactly. And unfortunately, this wasn't something any of Sylvia's children managed to accomplish. Mm. Koki may have gotten the closest to establishing her independence by moving in with the 48-year-old blacksmith, Martine. But keep in mind, she was an impoverished, pregnant teenager who needed any help she could get. Moving in with a man 30 years her senior may have been more of a matter of need than a step toward differentiation and independence. As we discussed in part one, a number of years before murdering her friend Clotilde, Sylvia became devoted to Santa Muerte. Sylvia believed the bony lady could protect her family and bring them peace and prosperity. Sylvia and her daughters created an altar to Saint Death in their home. They lit candles around her image, brought the typical small offerings like tequila, tobacco, and candy, and they venerated her. But as they continued to struggle financially, Sylvia's relationship to Santa Muerte grew more intense. According to Sylvia's son, Omar, his mother and sisters talked to La Muerte. Sylvia came to believe that Santa Muerte required a substantial offering to help them, that she required human sacrifice. This led to Sylvia murdering Clotilde on December 4, 2009. Sylvia's father, Cipriano, and her daughter, Koki, who was already living with Martine, helped dispose of the body. Once the deed was done and the dirt tamped down, Sylvia faced a profound question. Would Santa Muerte deliver on their requests? Whatever resistance Sylvia's family may have initially had to her ideas of human sacrifice, after the first murder had come and gone, no one was innocent anymore. And after watching Sylvia ax her friend to death, they had every reason to believe she could do the same to them. They did say later that she threatened to kill them if they didn't do what she said. Good point. Sylvia's power over her children was similar to that of other cult leaders. But unlike someone like Charles Manson, who had to select and groom strangers to create a group he called the family, Sylvia's accomplices were built in. They were her family. 
The psychological grooming that a cult leader or a sexual abuser employs is the process of befriending an individual and building their trust until they let down their guard and inhibitions and become easier to manipulate. But Sylvia's children had been reliant on her since birth. Right, which had made it that much easier for her to move them in the direction she wanted, even when that path led to murder. Months passed after Clotilde's death as she lay in her shallow grave near the family's shacks. If Santa Muerte bestowed favors on the Moraz family, they weren't enough to markedly change their fortune. Sylvia soon claimed that the bony lady wanted more blood. The family needed to make another human sacrifice. Sylvia told her family that this time Santa Muerte wanted them to kill a child, so that's what they'd have to deliver. Sylvia enlisted her son, Omar, to bring her a young boy. Eight months after Sylvia killed Clotilde, on July 23, 2010, Omar walked Martin Rios Chaparro, nicknamed Tete, out of Nakasari's Alicilo neighborhood. Tete had lived just three doors down from Koki and her partner, Martin Baron. Ten-year-old Tete went willingly with Omar. Like Clotilde, Tete was familiar with the Marazes. He'd spent time at the family's shacks because he was family. Tete was the stepson of Sylvia's partner, Eduardo. Tete joined his stepfather's family under a nearly full moon. He had no idea he would never see the sunrise again. That night, the Marazes took Tete to a clearing not far from their shacks. They'd constructed a makeshift room with rope, scrap wood, and blankets for walls. The family was terrible at covering their tracks, but seemed to have learned that killing outside their house meant they didn't have to scrub blood off their walls and floor. At their new outdoor site, the Marazes nailed a picture of Santa Muerte to a tree and lit candles beneath it. They positioned Santa Muerte so she could watch over them while they committed murder in her name. They didn't want young Tete to suffer, so they decided to ply him with alcohol. They made him keep drinking until he was so intoxicated he fell on the ground. While the alcohol may have dulled the pain, Tete is sure to have felt what happened next. They made marks on his neck in preparation for the deed. Then, Sylvia's youngest daughter, Yahaira, who was only 13, slit the 10-year-old's throat and stabbed him 30 times. They slit Tete's wrists and collected his blood. Some reports say that they beheaded the boy. After Tete was dead, they poured his blood on their altar to Santa Muerte, asking her to protect them and bless them with good health. They also asked her to let them know where there was money they could steal. Sylvia and Eduardo, Tete's stepfather, carried Tete's body to a nearby stream. They left him there, exposed to the elements and scavenging animals, less than 100 meters from their shacks. When Tete's mom and boyfriend reported him missing, the town went on alert. But no one made the connection between the missing 55-year-old Clotilde and the 10-year-old boy. Tete's mom and boyfriend were told by acquaintances that they'd seen the boy begging in the streets of Agua Prieta, a border town to the north. Tete's mom informed police, but Tete was never found. Unfortunately, that was the end of the investigation into his whereabouts. A local police official said, quote, we had no reason to suspect it was a homicide. If only people had looked longer and harder for Tete, perhaps the morass's reign of terror would have ended. Mm. But left to their own devices, Sylvia and her family would kill again. Here's something we think you'll find interesting. If you're looking for a new show to watch, you have to check out the new Hulu original series, The Looming Tower. This new limited series is based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book by Lawrence Wright. The show traces the rising threat of Osama bin Laden and how the rivalry between the FBI and CIA may have led to the tragic events of 9-11. The series follows members of the I-49 squad in New York and Alex Station in Washington, D.C. as they travel the world, fighting for ownership of information. But they seem to be working toward the same goal preventing a devastating attack. 
starring Emmy winner Jeff Daniels, Golden Globe nominee Peter Sarsgaard, and Tahar Rahim as Ali Sufan, The Looming Tower, available now only on Hulu. And here's something else we want to share with you. I went to the dentist last week, and the appointment went so smoothly. My dentist was so impressed with my teeth, thanks to Quip. Quip has combined dentistry and design to make a toothbrush that packs just the right amount of vibrations. Quip can suction to your mirror or its mount, which doubles as a hygienic cover. Its guiding pulses make it easy to brush just the right amount, and you never have to remember when to replace your brush heads with Quip's subscription plan. It's only $5 for every three months, including free shipping worldwide. Find out for yourself why Quip is backed by a network of dental professionals and was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions of the year. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash cults right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash cults. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash cults. Now, let's get back to the story. Though Tete's mother still wondered where he was and mourned for her lost child, the town of Nakasari once again went back to its usual habits, the mysterious disappearances fading into the background. By March 2012, the Moraz family had grown. They'd added another child who was one. Again, we don't know whose child it was, just that they now had a total of three young ones with them, ages one, two, and five. The two-year-old was Koki's kid. That same March, a year and nine months after Tete's disappearance, another boy went missing. On March 6, 2012, under a full moon, Eduardo abducted his step-nephew, 10-year-old Jesus Octavio Martinez Barone. While Octavio's parents worried about why their son hadn't come home, Silvia and her family took Octavio to the same partial shelters where they'd killed Tete. Just as they had done with Tete, they got Octavio drunk. He became increasingly listless and eventually passed out on a dirty mattress under the watchful eyes of Santa Muerte, whose picture was nailed to the tree. Sylvia and her eldest daughter, Francisca, collaborated in killing Octavio. They sliced open his neck and wrists and let his blood spill into containers until he bled out. Like they did with Tete, the Morazes poured Octavio's blood at their altar to Santa Muerte. It's surprising that even though the family's circumstances hadn't changed significantly, they kept killing. It's not logical, but likely relates to a concept we've discussed before sunk cost fallacy. Sometimes the deeper we get into a hole, the more reluctant we are to climb out before getting what we're after. It can feel like, well, if I just go a little farther, I'll reach my goal, and then everything I've put in will have been worth it. The problem arises when the hole just keeps getting deeper and deeper, with no end in sight, and we still can't walk away. The Morazes decided not to leave Octavio's body out in the open like they did with Tay-Tay. There are conflicting reports about where Octavio was buried. Eduardo either dug a hole in one of Sylvia's daughter's rooms or just outside next to one of the shacks. After they dumped Octavio's body in the hole and covered it with dirt, they poured concrete over it in order to block the inevitable smell of decomposition. The family lived with the unmarked grave day in and day out. They walked over it. The children played on it. It was a constant reminder of what they had done to Octavio, and by extension, Clotilde and Tete. While the Moraz family waited again for Santa Muerte to deliver on their requests, the village of Nakasari de Garcia was in a state of panic. The fact that there were now two missing 10-year-old boys was alarming. Something was very wrong. But what? Who would take these boys, and why? Local police began an investigation, the state of Sonora's busy missing persons unit even sent agents to Nakasari. The town was plastered with posters of sweet-faced Octavio, smiling in a blue and gold Letterman-style basketball jacket. Police had no viable leads and no real idea what they were looking at. 
If anyone saw the boys with members of the Mraz family, it wasn't sparking suspicion. They were family. However, Santa Muerte must not have been protecting the Mrazes, because someone very close to them, someone who knew both boys, made a critical connection that would lead to their capture. Koki Mraz's boyfriend, Martin Barone, was saddened and disturbed by Tete's disappearance. After all, Tete was their neighbor, living only three doors down from the couple. And the second boy, Octavio, was Martin Barone's stepson from a previous relationship. So his disappearance was even more troubling. One night after Octavio's disappearance, Martin was at home watching the Discovery Channel. He saw a show about human sacrifice with a story about a group of people who sacrificed children and threw them in a well. Martin said, quote, It was a premonition to see how they also lived in poverty and used drugs, and I wanted to investigate why we were losing children, end quote. Martin had never liked Koki's family. They made him feel uncomfortable, and he'd seen their pictures of Santa Muerte. He realized that Sylvia's family knew both of the boys. It didn't seem like much to go on, but the feeling that the Mrazes might be involved with the disappearances of the two boys nagged at Martin. Even so, Martin was afraid to go to the authorities. On the one hand, he worried that the police might think that he was nuts. On the other hand, he also worried that if he was right, the police might think he was involved, since he lived with Koki. He didn't want to get blamed for whatever horrible thing may have happened. But on March 22nd, 16 days after Octavio vanished, Martin made up his mind and went to the police. He told them what he suspected and why. Now the police knew both missing boys had connections to the Mraz family. The critical piece of the puzzle had fallen into place. Days later, on March 28th, police paid a visit to the Mraz family's shacks. While on site, they started asking family members about Octavio. CSIs found traces of blood spread for over 100 feet around the Mraz's altar to Santa Muerte. They were obviously in the right place. As the Mrazes were questioned, their stories quickly broke down in contradictions. The police pressed them, and the family members confessed what they'd done to Octavio. They also confessed to killing Tete and Clotilde. They pointed fingers at each other and assigned blame, but one thing stayed consistent. They all said that Sylvia was the one who started everything. The Mrazes then revealed the locations of the bodies. While authorities searched for remains, someone got detained family members to answer questions on video. Sitting in the back of a white police pickup truck, Sylvia's eldest daughter, Francisca, said, quote, I would do what she ordered me to do because I was afraid, because she would threaten us saying she'd kill us. In the back of another white pickup, Sylvia's partner Eduardo and daughter-in-law Soyla also claimed that they went along with Sylvia out of fear. Soyla said, quote, she threatened me, saying she'd kill me, end quote. There's a picture from the day of their arrest of Sylvia sitting alone on a stump-sized box. Her white shoes were dirty and worn. She wore dark blue jeans and a purple zip-up knit top. Her hands were handcuffed in front of her, pressed together between her knees as if in prayer. She stared at the ground somewhere just out of frame with a strangely placid but heavy expression. Police dug up Clotilde's tiny frame, still wrapped in a blanket. They searched the stream bed for Tete, but he wasn't where Sylvia and Eduardo said they'd left him. Police kept looking downstream and eventually found Tete's skeletal remains. He'd been washed away when the water was high and dropped again when the water level receded. They didn't find his head. In order to recover Octavio, who'd been missing just over 20 days, investigators had to break apart the concrete slab. Sylvia, 44, Cipriano, 83, Omar, Francisca, 21, Georgina, 20, Yahaira, 15, Eduardo, 37, and Soyla, 45, were shuttled from Nakasari back to Sylvia's birthplace, Hermosillo, the Sonoran capital for booking. Using DNA from the recovered bodies, authorities were able to confirm the identities of Clotilde Pacheco Romero, Martin Rios Chaparro, a.k.a. Tete, and Jesus Octavio Martinez Yanez. Investigators searched around the Mraz's shacks for additional bodies, but none were found. 
For a time, authorities suspected there might be other members of the group the media had started to call the Sect of Nakosari, maybe family members in other towns, but no additional arrests were made. Martin Baron Lopez, the man who helped crack the case, wasn't arrested. But due to a mistake made by the district attorney's spokesperson, it was frequently and erroneously reported that he was Sylvia's biological son and arrested as her number two. More credible reports claim that Eduardo, Sylvia's partner, was her key accomplice. But Eduardo denied he was more than another participant. We can't corroborate his claim, but either way, it's troubling that he lured his own stepson to his death and buried him under concrete. Time for a quick change of subject. If you're planning a wedding, you should check out Zola. Zola is reinventing the wedding planning and registry experience to make the happiest moment in couples' lives even happier. With over 500 top brands and 50,000 gifts, experiences, and cash funds, Zola Registry has everything you love about your favorite department store. Plus things like honeymoon funds, fitness classes, wine subscriptions, and more. Plus, Zola offers price matching and free shipping. You can even personalize your registry with photos and notes. And Zola's full suite of tools can be managed from the Zola Weddings app. Zola's friendly customer service team will go above and beyond, helping your loved one pick out the perfect blender, walking your grandmother through the registry, and more. Join over 300,000 couples who have used Zola. To sign up with Zola and receive a $50 credit towards your registry, go to Zola.com slash cults. That's Zola, Z-O-L-A, dot com slash cults for $50 towards your registry. Now, let's get back to the story. Something unique about the justice system in Mexico is that in high-profile cases, such as the sect of the Nakasaris, the authorities make the suspects available during a press conference very shortly after their arrest. In this case, on March 30th, two days after the family's arrest, the state spokesman, Jose Laranaga, briefed the press on the facts, including, quote, Sylvie Moraz stated that she was convinced that offering human sacrifices to Santa Muerte would bring her benefits, both economically and health-wise, and give protection to the family. That's why she's persuaded the other members of the family to carry out these rites, end quote. According to Larnaga, the entire family confessed to being involved. Then the authorities brought out the first group of suspects. Soila, Silvia, Georgina, and Koki were led out with their arms linked together. They were flanked by two heavily armed, black-masked female guards. The Mraz women looked bedraggled, still in the clothes they were arrested in two days before. Their shoelaces were missing, likely removed by the authorities as a precaution against suicide. Silvia held a large framed picture of Santa Muerte, presumably one they let her take from home. In the picture, Santa Muerte's menacing, grinning skull looks out from her place, seated on a throne made of bones with claw-footed legs. She's wearing a red cloak, and a gold cross on a chain hangs from her neck. In her right hand, she holds a scythe with an enormous blade that frames the entire throne. In her left hand, she holds a bat. The scales of justice hang from its wings. The text of the picture reads, quote, Saint Death Protectors. You know well, beloved death, that danger and adventure are part of the way I transit in this life. Beloved death, let your protection and safeguard be on my side to keep distant danger and threat. Allow, my beloved death, that the eyes of my opponents may not see my presence, nor the hue of my footsteps that covet your temple, where majestically you wait patiently for the end of time. Amen. End quote. The press conference was something of a feeding frenzy. Reporters shoved microphones and recording devices right up into the suspects' faces to capture their comments. In these interviews, Sylvia seemed somewhat bewildered. Though she admitted to her role in the murders and that she did them for Santa Muerte, she said, quote, In regards to whether we do satanic sacrifices and those things they're accusing us of, that's not true. People accuse me of being a witch, but the only way I resemble a witch is that I haven't taken a bath in days. 
Did Sylvia explain why she killed? Not to anyone's satisfaction. She said, quote, for stupid reasons one tends to believe, end quote. She became tearful and shied away from the reporters, but continued, quote, we believe in that stuff, but then you decide to do it. It was something we all got in our heads. Sylvia claimed that the police told her she'd ruined everyone's lives and that she should confess to everything so that the others could go free. Right, but Sylvia maintained that she would only tell the truth about what had actually happened. She said she killed Clotilde and helped kill Octavio with her oldest daughter, Francisca, but that Yahaira, her youngest daughter, had killed Tete. This all lined up with the other family members' statements. The authorities took the women away and brought out the men, Cipriano, Eduardo, and Omar. They were handcuffed and flanked by armed guards. Omar told reporters that Silvia and his sisters were the ones who talked to Santa Muerte. He claimed that when he brought Tete to his mom, he didn't know she planned to kill him. Omar made it sound like the men didn't know very much about what the women were up to. About Tete, Omar said, quote, My mom had him killed. La Muerte would ask her to do that. End quote. The reporter pressed, but who would actually kill them? Omar replied, quote, well, she and my sister, and the youngest sister, she also killed someone, end quote. When the reporter asked how Omar's female family members killed their victims, Omar said, quote, I don't know, they never told us, but they were the guilty ones. La Muerte would ask them to kill and to cut their head off, end quote. Eduardo also spoke to reporters. He insisted that he didn't know when he was arrested that one of the murdered children was his stepson. Eduardo claimed that he believed Tete had been kidnapped. He told reporters that he filed a complaint about the child's disappearance and that he'd raised the boy since childhood. Eduardo said, quote, I began to mourn and they never told me anything. Yet according to the reports we've read, Eduardo and Sylvia disposed of Tete's body together. If those reports are true, then they invalidate Eduardo's story. One thing authorities were decidedly convinced of is that Sylvia was the architect of the human sacrifices. Examination of the remains confirmed that the victim's veins were sliced open while they were still alive. A slew of charges were filed in the sixth court against these seven adults, including criminal association, qualified premeditated murder, and corruption of minors. They will likely spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Sylvia's daughter, Yahaira, who was 15 years old at the time of her arrest, was sent to the Institute for the Treatment and Implementation of Measures for Adolescents. NNC Mexico reported that according to Ernesto Monroe Palacio, Secretary of State Public Security, psychologists determined that Yahaira was so indoctrinated into her family's murderous practices that she thought what they were doing was normal, and she didn't know that it was serious. Monroe Palacio also said that three other family members, minors of ages 1, 2, and 5, were presumed to have witnessed Octavio's murder, and they were also in custody. Family and minors advocate Francisco Javier Gomez Izaguirre said, quote, According to the experience and opinion of experts, when children are as small as one or two years old, there is no harm, but when a minor of four or five years who understands the fact, there is an impact. End quote. Regardless of age, the children experienced a lot of trauma. They witnessed horrible things and were also separated from the only family they knew, however dysfunctional that family may have been. Hmm. Hopefully all the children got the support they needed to have a chance at a better life. We may never really know why Silvia went down such a destructive path, but like Santa Muerte's more extreme narco devotees, she may have gravitated to Santa Muerte because the folk saint's fierce, skeletal image resonated with something dark inside of Sylvia. Perhaps similarly to how David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians, was drawn to the darker content in the Book of Revelation. Sure. It's not actually the material itself that's the problem, but the mindset of the believer. We haven't found any reports of a psychological examination of Sylvia, and it's hard to fathom how she came up with the idea she could get rich quick by making human sacrifices to Santa Muerte. Perhaps something else was driving her to kill, but we may never know what it was. The town of Nakasari responded to the revelation of the family's involvement in the triple homicide with a vigil. 
People gathered in the main square, dressed in white, to demonstrate their sorrow and support to the families of the victims. Even though the Morazes were under arrest, for a time, young people in the town remained terrified. High school students texted their parents from school one day saying they'd seen a woman dressed in black, who they thought was Santa Muerte. The school and parents had to calm the students down and let them know that it was all in their imaginations. Services were held and prayers were said for Clotilde, Tete, and Octavio. Today, the small mining town of Nacosari de Garcia is quiet once again. People have gone back to their lives. They don't want others to remember and stigmatize their town for the terrible crimes that took place there. But they will never forget the victims of Silvia Moraz Moreno and the so-called sect of Nakosari. Thanks again for tuning into Cults. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Cults, you can find them on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Tuesday for a brand new episode of Cults. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Kenny Hobbs, with production assistance by Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire, Carly Madden, and Jeanette Manning. Cults is written by M.W. Cartosian Wilson and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Don't miss the premiere of Hulu's new original, The Looming Tower, based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning book by Lawrence Wright. This series traces the rising threat of Osama bin Laden and how a rivalry between the FBI and the CIA may have set a path for the tragedy of 9-11. The Looming Tower is available now, only on Hulu.